We're really glad that John always has one more area of Christmas ornaments that he hasn't presented to us, and it really is a treat to see all of the things that he's collected and sharing with you, so we welcome John Hansen today. paper and cardboard, basically you turn into ephemera decorations, and we're going to span anywhere from late 1800s through basically the 1960s. And the first paper ornaments on the tree would have necessarily have been items that were made by the family. They would have been the old paper chains that some of you might have remembered making in high or grade schools or cut out um, snowflake type ornaments. And as the popularity of Christmas decorations increased, some of the first ornaments that were imported from Germany were called Dresden ornaments. And I'll let you, Fred, if you want to, we get a little bit of sparkly with it. But basically, it's a cardboard ornament that has basically kind of like aluminum foil covering over it. And then they would have been painted um, whichever colors. These, that's a flat one. This butterfly. Um, it's kind of hard to tell with the picture, but all of those within the wings 
you, you can come up later and take a look at it, you can kind of see the holes are cut out. I mean, can you just imagine the time that would have taken to cut out those little holes to make the lacy of the wings? Um, besides the one-dimensional, they also made uh, three-dimensional. This happens to be a candy container, and it is a potato. I don't know if that will show up. How did they Either. preserve that? It, it, again, it, it's just a pressed cardboard, and it just happens. Oh. It, oh. That, like I said, these dresser ornaments are pressed cardboard. Okay. And it wasn't a real thing. No, no, it's, <laughs> it's cardboard. And this one is a peanut, and inside is a little doll, little toy doll, as a surprise for a little girl. But you can see it's got a little string on it that it could have been hung on the tree. Just as with some people now, um, ladies and kids necessarily make scrapbooks. Scrapbooks were popular in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. And with them making scraps, eventually, Someone got the idea that these would necessarily make a good Christmas decoration. And the ladies and the children might spend their evenings going through magazines and cutting out pictures that they like. And they could have bought this tinsel and basically just put it around the picture and make an ornament out of it. And if, hopefully if it shows up, you can see it's actually a advertisement for KC baking powder, if you remember that. And there were larger ones. Eventually, um, stationery stores started just selling entire sheets of these pictures and then you could take them home and cut out and make your own ornaments. This is just a little cardboard and tissue, tissue paper angel. And many stores started producing advertising pieces to help advertise their store. This here is for star soap, and it's just a great Santa image, but it was a little advertising card that would have been given out at Christmas time. This one here Union Pacific Tea Company. What year was that? Uh, I'm not sure if this one has a year. A lot of these were basically late 1800s, early 1900s. I thought maybe it was a calendar on the back. No, it, it's um, giving, I believe, it's hard to see in the slide, but I think it's giving the location of all the different stores that sold Union Pacific tea. Okay. So it's basically... If you're in this town, here's where you need to go to get your tea. Just another great early Santa image. A little nativity image, and again, these are all just cardboard. But decorations. This Santa here 
has a little easel on the back, but uh, whether one of the members of the family wrote Christmas 1932, Vern and Esther Taylor. So that helps to date this piece to 1932. Along with, uh, with the advertising, companies would have put out calendars and this one happens to date 1953 and on the back it says printed in Germany so basically you could order whichever type of top you wanted and then you could have in the center piece your company's name printed on it and then have a ready calendar for your valued customers. This is another calendar top, uh, just missing the calendar part of it. Mm -hmm. But again, just the artwork. And this one is printed in Western Germany, so this would date it after World War II. <laughs> Another early paper Christmas ornament were these, and these were called Kringlelets, and they're just a paper ornament to be hung on the tree. There was a whole series of different shapes. But again, these are early uh, 20s and 1930s. John, I'm sure they weren't using candles on the tree. <laughs> you, you've got to think, though. I mean, I mean, like these scrap ornaments, these were late 1800s, early 1900s. They were on the tree. The tissue paper ornaments, and these are just small ones. They had large tissue paper angels. They were on the trees with the candles. And it was necessarily a fire hazard, but you got to think, the tradition was that the tree did not go up until Christmas Eve. And with a lot of the families, Santa brought the tree. The kids knew that mom and dad stored the ornaments for him, but Santa brought the tree and decorated it and left the presents. And also, trees were not cut a month or two in advance. They were cut necessarily the night before you went out to your own woods and cut a tree, or uh, for the few uh, places that did sell trees, they were still necessarily not cut, you know, months in advance. And your houses were not heated like they are now. So trees did not dry out near as fast. And when they did light the candles, you know, dad or grandpa lit the candles ooh ah for about 5, 10, 30 seconds, then all the candles were blown out because it was still dangerous. So, But they weren't left burning like an entire evening. I don't know if this will show up. I actually, I went to an antique show Friday night and this is one of the pieces I got. And it's not showing up well. You can come up afterwards and take a look, but it's the card game of Santa Claus, the Parker Brothers game, and then the dealer had actually put like the plastic shrink wrap around it because the box was falling apart, but he kept the cards out, and I don't know if that'll show, that's one of the Santa figures on that we're in with that card game. With the Christmas giving, you had the little gift tags that might have been on the gifts. This one is to Ida from Fred, 1905. This one was actually uh, 
given to my great grandmother, Seth. We found it in with her possessions. Wishing you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. This is Fred Hetty. And for those who may not know, Fred Hetty was instrumental with the early history of the Grand Island Independent here in town. And then there's a message written in back in German, which honestly I have not gotten it interpreted yet. But just some of the artwork on these tags, and again, you can come up later and take a closer look. I mean, you just can't compare it to what is out there nowadays. This Santa here is an advertising piece, and on his belt, there's a big W, and it's Westinghouse Electric. So we assume, you know, he, there's holes in his little hands that he was holding some sort of maybe electrical cord or something, or maybe another little sign advertising something from Westinghouse. But it just would have been kind of an at attention getter at Christmas time for um, an advertising piece for the company. Uh, this, another advertising piece, E. Shademan Harness and Saddlery Goods, Wisner, Nebraska. And again, just the artwork and the graphics that they put into these items. In, we're going to jump ahead a little bit, in the 40s and 50s, not so popular now, but a lot of people smoked. And they had big Christmas matchbooks, and you could either find the right one, put your family's name on it. This is Clifford Cameron. But inside, the matches make a design article. But that'll show up. And this is Master Sergeant and Mrs. William C. Meyer. And it's another just brief set. This one is the serviceman's best wish, good luck, um, Masonic Services Center. And this, you can, this only has three matches left. You can see it's red, white, and blue. On the back, it says victory. So it was during World War II. This here is a homemade, basically, Christmas card or Christmas booklet. It says, 1902, Christmas greetings to one I love. And each page has little decorations. The stocking full of wishes true. I'm to show my love for you. When stars of Christmas shine, lighting the skies, let only loving looks be from your eyes. And there's numerous pages, and on the last page, it's from George to his grandma. Aww. So, but again, that's from 1902. Someone else had made a homemade guest book, and it's guest book Christmas 1899. And there's Sleep Sweetly in the Quiet Room, O True Whoever Thou Art, and Let Us Mournful Yesterday Disturb Thy Quiet Heart. Thy maker in thy changeless friend, his love surrounds me still. 
forget thyself and all the world. Put out each light for put out each light for stands or for stars are watching overhead. Sleep tightly then. Good night. And it's got apparently they had different events, but it's got different dates, different signatures going from 1899 and then it stops at 1910. So someone just again made a little guest book and started out at Christmas. Do you have any idea what state or town I I can tell you I got it at an auction uh, around the Junietta area roughly probably 10 or 15 years ago. Is there any names in there that are recognizable? I don't recognize names. Um, like I said, afterwards, you're certainly welcome to come up and take a look. But um, I assume uh, it's all just family names from around that area. Other paper ornaments and decorations besides the scraps and the cringolettes, the ornaments on this tree date basically from the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. And you've got the little rocking horse, and there's a carriage, baby carriage, and a wagon, and drums. These type of ornaments here, you see the snowman, and I, there should be icicles and Santa Claus. These were glow-in-the-dark ornaments, and they were, you know, made to, at night, glow-in-the-dark on your tree. A lot of you, I'm sure, recognize the honeycomb bells and ornaments. These are just some table decorations. This is a little basket with Santa with the honeycomb paper. Honeycomb candle. And again, these are just tissue paper and cardboard ornaments. This is basically a little drink coaster and maybe a chain for change. This came from the Leader Cranks here in town. Years ago they had a basically a rummage sale um, in one of the rooms and I went there and they had a few of these little paper coasters and obviously I picked those up. They're from the Leader Cranks. And just paper little dishes for you know, having a little Christmas party. Little maybe nut cups or little candy cups for your table. Back in I'm going to say the 30s, 40s, and 50s, you could have gotten a letter from Santa. Basically, a company would have printed up these little letters, and then the parent would write the children's name on it. And this is what this one reads. This is to Patricia. Well, bust my buttons if it isn't Christmas time again. Those reindeer of mine are so sleek and sassy, they just naturally dance around. They're so anxious to get started. And my sleigh is all shiny with fresh red paint. Why, bless your heart, Mother Claus even has my warm clothes all laid out for me. Fact is, I can hardly wait to get started myself. To tell you the truth, when I think how thrilled you'll be with those grand surprises which are bulging out of my pack, I don't know which of us is going to be the happiest. But remember, I can't stop at your house till you are sound asleep. So go to bed early on Christmas Eve and don't disappoint your old friend Santa Claus. 
And this is on the same order, a phantogram from Western Union. And you could have put your message to children or whoever on that as well. This has a good image of Santa Claus, but basically it's a giveaway by the E.J. Wallace Coal Company, and this is from St. Louis, Missouri. And it's just kind of a note to their customers, this January may be a tough one for coal. It gives their little reasonings why it might be good to stock up on coal for the season, but again, just a Christmas-related item. On the trees, I mentioned the leader cramps here in town, the leader cramps, the plottage, many churches would, uh, they always had a Christmas party for the children, and when I was going to the plottage, by that time, the peanuts and the candies and maybe an apple or an orange were just in a paper sack. But some clubs or organizations might have had these little cardboard boxes filled up with your candy, your peanuts, fold the ends down, seal it up, and then it could have been hung on your tree. And there were hundreds of different styles of these boxes that were made. Again, whether they were clubs, schools, churches, some of the older ones came in shapes like this. And this one has, you know, different kind of nursery rhymes on it. Puss in Boots, Peter Peter Pumpkin Eater, Jack and the Beanstalk. But again, these were just early candy containers. This is a very small candy container. Let's see if you can oh. <laughs> Okay. But it's basically just a little suitcase. It's just a little suitcase, and it would have held just a couple little pieces of candy in it. This early survivor, this would have been bought at a store. This is from the 1930s, but it's just the box for the old ribbon candy. And just, you know, the graphics on the box, but there is a date on it in its early 1930s. Another candy box. This would have been filled with individual chocolate Santas that you would have bought at the store. But again, just like I said, I love the old graphics on these old containers. This, another candy container box, but this one has a little added feature of Santa going up the chimney. This here, Santa, but it's called a little gift bag on the back. So you could have filled it up with whatever for the children. It says Santa sack, and this one went to, looks like Mabel. Got that originally. Um, these can container boxes. On the one side, you've got 
different houses or buildings. So like you can see on the back, it's just your regular flat cardboard can container box, but just a little extra design that they put on there to be kept to make maybe a Christmas scene under your tree at Christmas or to have it tucked away in the branches. Again, with advertising, this piece here, again, ball bearing carpet sweeper, so it's got to be late 1800s, early 1900s. It's just an advertising piece, kind of an attention getter, but it's just cardboard. The poinsettias are basically colored tissue paper, and it would have set over an early lamp, and just an attention getter to help stimulate some sales for Bissell to sell a carpet sweeper because what woman wouldn't have want the best gift of a <laughs> vacuum cleaner at Christmas? What else could you give a woman? <laughs> if not the Christmas boxes, you could buy sacks, Santa's surprise package for girls, and this one is for boys, that you could have bought and filled up with treats for the children. Many newspapers back in the early 1900s, this was the front page, this one is Special Christmas ed edition, Mon Damon Enterprise from Harrison County, Iowa, and this is early 1900s, but this would have been their front page of their Christmas edition newspaper. And I talked about the scrap ornaments. This came out of a large scrapbook, because here's the back. So, Someone had it in a large scrapbook, and it's got the two different sides of it from that page. This one, another front page, again, early 1900s. This is the Aurora paper. So, the Hamilton, Hamilton County Advocate, Aurora, Nebraska, Tuesday, December 13th, it looks like 1914 or 15. But again, someone had just saved that. In the stores, you've got the different signage to help with sales, with the Christmas imagery. This here is actually to promote um, purchase union label gifts, demand union services, union label and service trades department, AFL-CIO. But again, just another Christmas piece. In the store, you would have had your signs, holiday candies, gift wrapping and decorations. This picture here is just the front, or not the front, but it came out of the Saturday evening post, and it's December 19th. Uh, 1925, and it's an advertisement for Edison Mazda Christmas lamps, and it says, his first Christmas, a great big tree, a tiny boy, and the magic touch of life, since that long night, long ago, when a glowing star guided the Magi to the child of Bethlehem, the happiness of Christmas has been told in life. 
Light up your tree this year with Edison Mazda Christmas tree lamps. They are safe, dependable, and add a greater touch of brilliancy and beauty. They keep the cheer of Christmas in your home throughout the year. Edison Mazda lamps will make each room more cheerful and comfortable and add to childhood's happy memories. But again, just the imagery on that ad. This is basically a poster of, from the Saturday Evening Post. I honestly don't know the exact history if, if the Saturday Evening Post had these printed, but this is obviously from World War II, and you can see kind of the bad head, you know, headlines in the back, war, world, Hitler bombs, enemy raids, pay taxes, but then Santa's bursting through the newspaper to say Merry Christmas. So despite all of the bad news, Santa's still here to hopefully make sure that you have a Merry Christmas. With lighting, they even had paper lighting. These here are from the 30s and they're called World Glow Shades. And they're just a paper shade. There's a little cone with a little pin sticking up and it sets over the bulb. And there's a little piece of metal on the inside of this shade that rests on that pin and the heat from the ball causes the shades to spin. As you see, some spin better than others. The ones on either side are called gyro shades, and they're heavier. They're kind of like the old Dixie cups, if you remember those. And But working on the same principle, not mechanical, the heat drives the shade. You see, I've got three of them that are spinning. But these, especially the World Glow Shades, they were very popular in the 1930s into the 40s. And they made many different styles. Again, with the paper tags, these are an unused bundles of gift tags. I got these in um, Farwell a few years ago when Lucas Savage Furniture had their auction when they went out of business. This was some of the items they found of old store stock. More paper items, paper napkins. But again, nice graphics on the napkins. box of Kleenex tissue, but it's at Christmas time, and on the back it has instructions on how to make paper poinsettias, and this box has holly red or holly green tissue in it, so, but this, I can't remember the date on it, I know, I want to say this is from the 40s. It's just something that whoever bought it never used it and kept it all those years. These are just some examples of gift boxes. You could actually buy decorated boxes at Christmas time to put gifts in to put under the tree before necessarily wrapping paper came about, they sold an any size of gift box. And you buy what you need, put your presents in it, and it would be ready for under the tree. This is just a large cardboard Santa. His legs move. 
probably from the 40s. Some examples over here, early just books. This is a book, When Santa Was Late, from Chicago's Block Long Toy Store, Greetings from the Boston Store. And this would have been just a giveaway for children at Christmas. Some other early Christmas books. With the gift tags over there, a lot of them were made by a company called Denison. And they actually put out books that you could have purchased and it would have gave you decorating ideas. Denison, besides selling the gift tags, they sold different types of tissue paper. They were basically a paper company. Anything paper related, they sold. And again, you could buy these gift books. This is 10 cents and it has all kinds of decorating ideas for to use with tissue paper, etc. They also had comic books, Looney Tunes, Santa Claus Funnies. A lot of you may remember the gas company put out recipe books. This is Consumers Public Power District. This is Central Electric and Gas Company. And they were just recipe booklets for that particular year. And you've got your Christmas catalogs store catalogs to say what they had for sale that Christmas season. This is Coast to Coast. And this is Gambles. With the earlier um, calendar tops that we had there, these are later ones. This is just one from Bradley Standard Service from Gary, Nebraska. And it's just a calendar but given away or sold at Christmas time to advertise their service station. And this one here, Johnson Brothers from Waverly, Nebraska. But again, just a service station. And this is 1947. This is an early basically sad toy, and again, it's just two-sided cardboard, but oh, a little toy for Santa to go walking. But this is early, or I'm sorry, late 1800s, early 1900s era. Honeycomb, they called these dancing Santas. They made other holiday ones that were dancing witches and stuff. And just again, low cardboard and tissue paper. Some of you may remember decorating with the cray paper fireplaces make your own fireplace scene at Christmas. Again, this is just a thin, basically, type of tissue paper. This is chimney design. This one is from Denison's, as I talked with the book there, decorated crepe paper. But this one has a holly design on it. 
they made hundreds of different designs of decorated crepe paper. This is a box of tissue wrapping paper. Another just paper advertising piece when it came out of the catalog, uh, advertising Christmas lights. But you know, us collectors, we are always looking at old magazines, looking for different Christmas-related advertisements within them. And a lot of us will have them framed as I did there. Over here, you can come up later and take a look. Basically, Christmas greeting cards anywhere from mainly the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and then a couple of different Christmas bags, shopping bags. That's Jack and Jill, and I forget this one. Just says crown sack, but just a couple of shopping bags with a Christmas design. Um, again, just some other little Christmas advertising, store advertising pieces that would have the price tag that they would set these up next to whichever item they're selling. A couple of cardboard Santa heads, just again, home or store decoration. Does anybody have any questions? Do you decorate at Christmas time at home? <laughs> I, I do somewhat. Um, the basement is basically display cases and full. Um, otherwise, each year I do a big display at Stewart Museum on behalf of the Historical Society to decorate the Stolly House here in town, which, if some of you don't know, is an old historic home. And we have a Christmas open house there. And then I usually do some displays down at one of the antique shops here in town. Any other questions? Yes? I noticed one of the things that I had when I was a little was that in well, uh, you put on a Christmas tree face at icicle. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, that I had stuck on my head. Then we had to take it off every year and reuse Oh, yeah. And that old was lead originally. Really? Yeah. Lead. Lead icicles. And, and also we had, they were plastic, but they, if you shut the lights off, they would glow. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Icicles? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. They had glow in the dark, dark icicles. I personally have, I've seen them in other collections. I have not found any yet. Any other questions? Yes. Do you have kind of network with other collectors and find out you know, what the years are and find out more detail? There is an international organization called the Golden Glow of Christmas Past. And it is a worldwide group of Christmas collectors. And each year, somewhere in the United States, we have a convention. And it's basically a week-long convention at a big hotel. And people can bring one item or an entire collection where they have a big one of the big conference rooms set up it's called the museum room and they have cabinets and whatever where they set up displays they have workshops they have on how to say repair paper items how to repair glass ornaments um, how to make feather trees there are um, you know there's dinners that we have each evening but Honestly, one of the main things that we go for is called room hopping. And basically, people are set up in their hotel rooms and they're selling out of their hotel rooms. And so you're going from room to room looking for that one item that you're trying to find. But again, it's called the Golden Globe Christmas Pass. They're on Facebook. And again, it's, it's a worldwide organization. I've been a member since 
the late 80s, early 90s, and I learned a lot from that. And unfortunately, I somewhat learned too much because it's like, oh, something new to start collecting, <laughs> something new to look out for. I didn't know that existed. So, so, yes. When um, do the lights? They look like a candle. The electric lights come. Well, the very first. You know the the ones the bubble. Oh, the bubble lights. Okay. The bubble lights technically came out right before World War II. They were on the market Christmas 1941 in a few select stores in like Chicago and New York, the bigger cities. With the then Japan bombs Pearl Harbor, the war starts. What some people don't realize, all the metal that would have been in those electrical wirings and those sockets and stuff, had to now go to the war effort. So no Christmas lighting was produced during those war years. With the end of the war, they could start producing it again. So basically 1946 is when they were, you say, re-released the bubble light. And they were an instant hit. And from 1946 through the 60s, a lot of people don't realize there were over 30 different varieties of bubble light made. And there's still about four varieties that I haven't yet <laughs> found, but I'm still looking for them. Any other questions? Well, I'm going to show you one more thing. This is kind of a surprise. Um, with at the Christmas tags that I got at Farwell at Lucas Savage, I also picked up boxes of these gift bags and um, before you leave there's no hurry we're not going to run out but there is a pile in the back each one is welcome to one or two of these gift bags they're from the 1950s so you can do whatever you want with them but they're set back there and before you leave help yourself to them Again, these came from the Lucas Savage store in Farwell, and they date from about the 1950s. Wow. So, <laughs> yeah. wow. yes. otherwise, I will be up here. If anyone else has any other questions, you're free to come up and take a closer look. We've got food and drink mm -hmm. off to the side, and thank you again for coming. Yeah, Again, Bob checked you off on the list, and he has a drawing. And uh, we're going to draw for a which cast me out? Well, I've got two different cast me out. Okay, I think they're different ones. I, I thought yeah. I'd stay with the Christmas scene. I've got two different churches. Here. Okay, good. Okay, well, and uh, Isabel, give me another one. Okay, and the number between one and
Before we started, I passed out some of these bigger pants invitations at the beginning of the row. If you didn't get one, there's a pile back with the cats and the owls. Next Saturday at 4 o'clock, the Lady Pants is having a kickoff of their 150th anniversary, so you're invited to come. If you didn't get one, pick one up on the back table. Uh, we're going to be part of the program. John Nalstrom is representing the Historical Society rep uh, to commemorate this anniversary. Um, next month, Howard York is giving a program on the ordnance plan of the explosion that happened. We put up a historic marker uh, about that explosion recently, not too long ago, and he has a very detailed program with pictures about that. He's given a couple other programs in the ordinance plan. He's getting more professional with every one of them, and it's really, uh, we appreciate that he uh, uh, has really uh, kept track of all of this history. Do you know the date of that? Um, ninth, Howard, isn't it the ninth of February we said? Second Sunday of the month always. Uh, our program is always the second Sunday, and I believe it's the ninth here. At the, and then the next month is the one that uh, we kind of smile about. It's going to be the, the oldest profession in Grand Island, and, and uh, some of our board members are working up an interesting program going back to uh, prostitution in the early days when it was really quite a profession, and there were some rather well respected people in charge of the business. Um, Don, would you come up and tell us about the pancake feed that's coming up? Okay, the Hall County Historical Society, we're working on a marker uh, for the Wood River area. The Smith Anderson Indian attack that uh, happened in the early 1860s. And uh, we're working with a uh, scout by the name of Aaron Kelly. He's going for his uh, Eagle Scout Award. so. In any event, on uh, Sunday, the 26th, we've got a pancake feed to raise money for the, for the marker and help him out to raise some funds. I'll be at the community, the city slash community hall from 8 o'clock to 1 o'clock. So if you folks are hungry for pancakes and sausage. In Wood River. In Wood River, excuse me. So, yeah, it's not going to be here, it'll be at Wood River. So anyway, uh, you get to bring the family. Uh, and it's just going to be a free will offering breakfast, so thank you much. Where is the community hall? Is it on Main Street? No, it's, uh, I can't even know what street it is. It's a brand new building. Do you know where it is, Kathy? I don't really have that. It's right on Highway 30, isn't it? No, no. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a couple blocks to the north. Uh, I turned by the park there, and it's a brick building. You can't miss it. You can't miss it. It's just right off of uh, Yeah. Uh, the main street of block or something. Right, it's a very nice building, so. From Casey's General Store, so two blocks straight. That's, Casey's is a good market. So. Anyway, hope we can see you folks there. Is anybody else out of you? Uh, Maxine Rathman has all this interesting information about this massacre, and when her husband died, the memorial money was basic money that has started the fund for this. So we're glad we've been thinking about it for years. So we're glad we're able to get this off the ground. One interesting fact that I found out after we started this project, in fact, I think this mark has been in the work for about 10 years, but uh, Jeremy Jensen, the uh, former mayor, told us uh, his great-great-grandfather was one of those murdered in the massacre. Yeah, it's surprising. We didn't know much at all, but we're fine for. So if you can get to Wood River on the 26th of the month, the uh, time comes to pancake feed. Don is going to be the cook, and you know that's always good food. So uh, today, we have coffee and cookies on us, and thanks for coming. <laughs>